Let's pray for Jeanette as she speaks to us this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for the words you have given Jeanette. I pray now, Lord, that you will use her to speak to us. Bless her lips, Lord, and her tongue, her mind, Lord, and her heart, as she gives us your word this morning. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I speak in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Many years ago, um, Paul and I moved into a house with a lovely 70s orange bathroom. It was horrible. (laughs) There were cigarette burns on the bath, and the sink had a massive hole in it, which had been filled with blue car filler. (laughs) which they conveniently put a a, a flannel over when we were looking around the house. (laughs) So we set about putting in a new white suite. It was more complicated than we realised. First, when we took the bath out, we found that the wall and the floor (laughs) were mouldy and would both need replacing. And then it was so difficult to remove the cork tiles that were on the wall that it was easier to replace the whole wall. The funniest bit... Oh, sorry, that's the whole wall. (laughs) The funniest bit was when uh, Paul was chipping off the tiles on the, the wall at the far end, and I was casually leaning against the radiator watching, when suddenly the whole wall that I was leaning against fell off. It slipped, the the tiles slipped down the wall in one piece, along with the radiator. So I was like, (laughs) hanging on to the radiator. (laughs) So I was stuck there holding this radiator while Paul went to find a wrench to get the radiator off the wall. It was very, very funny. (laughs) The bathroom renovation uh, was really hard work, though, and at times it felt a bit too much and a bit hopeless. In fact, that whole house did. <laughs> there was, everything that we did was, was hard work. But we literally, for the bathroom, had to go back to an empty shell of a room in order to build a new bathroom. And this was a house, believe it or not, built in the 1980s. Sometimes it's necessary to strip everything back in order to start again with a clean sheet. COVID did that for us in many ways. At COGS, it meant we had to stop everything. Do you remember the phrase that the government stole from us? Building back better. We looked at the book of Nehemiah and aimed at putting back putting things back slowly and better than they had been before. And I think that that is what we did. In the space between, there was time to listen to what God wanted. Most things were different when we came back. Toddlers now has a Bible story. The hub became the bus stop cafe. But now we're having to pair back again. In the cafe, we suddenly went from having around 10 people volunteering in the kitchen to three people. Now, that's not anyone's fault, I hasten to add, but just because people got worn out. And I'd like to say a huge, huge thank you to Jim and Marion for the the sheer effort that you put in over the last two years. We couldn't have done it without you, so thank you so much. But but I am pleased that you've decided that enough is enough (laughs) and have decided to lay, lay it aside and rest. So at the moment, it feel, church life feels a little bit like this. When it should be like this. Raring to go because God is definitely at work here. Instead... Anyone who runs anything at COGS at the moment, I think, is feeling a little bit like this. We're all struggling for volunteers. But before you all get up and leave, (laughs) because the vicar's asking us to volunteer for something else, (laughs) I'm not. 
I think I heard a few sighs of relief then. <laughs> I am aware that 80% of the people in this church serve on some sort of rota. That is incredible. Most churches have nowhere near that number of people volunteering. We have a huge and dedicated team of volunteers for which we are extremely grateful. And we will thank you all properly later in the APCM. So we have all these volunteers, but we are still stretched. We are all feeling fairly exhausted, I think. It feels as though we can't function properly because limbs or other features are missing. And they're missing because we've been overused and become broken. And I'm sorry that I've allowed this to happen on my watch. Every part of the body is important. We know that. Paul tells us that in Corinthians. And every part of the body has to be cared for properly, not worn out. Each part needs refreshing and cleaning. You need to take your holidays and days off and breaks from rotors and time with family. So I'm not asking you to volunteer for something else. I'm saying that we need to slow down. And if that means stopping some of the activities and ministries, then so be it until we have enough volunteers. A few weeks ago, I was feeling quite broken and overwhelmed. And to be honest, it felt hopeless. But the Lord led me to today's passage. It might have seemed a strange passage to talk about vision, a valley of dry bones. I felt like a pile of dry bones. And I wonder how many others have felt like that recently. But look at what God says to Ezekiel. When Ezekiel says that only the sovereign Lord knows whether the bones can live, God commands Ezekiel, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath unto you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. God didn't just do it. He asked Ezekiel to do it. In fact, he commanded him to do it. So Ezekiel did, verse 7, so I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. And then God said, in verse 9, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. And they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. The Lord accomplished new life through Ezekiel prophesying. Now to prophesy is to say that you believe something will happen in the future. To speak the words of God over a situation. And I believe that that is what God is asking us to do at the moment, to prophesy over the place we find ourselves in, to speak the words of God over our lives. If God can turn a heap of bones into a vast army, then he can surely revive us by the power of his Holy Spirit. He can provide an army of volunteers. Ezekiel prophesies and speaks the word of God. And then the wind of God brings to life that which was dead. Now I think that this is a message for us as individuals as well as a whole church. Maybe you feel that your life is in bits and pieces at the moment. You feel a bit disassembled. I think, are there things that God wants you to speak over your life? God is able to put us back together. 
He is able to bring back to life what feels dead. He wants to breathe his life-giving breath into your body to make you whole and fully functioning. What about the whole, the, the worldwide church? We need to prophesy over the whole church, a church that is dismembered, divided. God is able to unite the church, to make it into the army he desires. Not factions and denominations, not those lording it over others because they think they're right and everybody else is wrong. God wants to breathe his life-giving breath into the dead bones of the church and bring together its different parts to work as one. We need to prophesy over our local church too. Cogs belongs to God. We had a series last year called Together. Oh, I think we're better than we were, but we're not totally together yet. And I still think that it's key for us to be together. The parts of the body are not all working together. God wants to breathe his life-giving breath into the bones and tendons and flesh which have become separated. When we are together, we will be a mighty army for God, like the one Ezekiel saw. The wind of the Spirit can transform all it touches. And so lastly, we need to prophesy over Crookhorn, to speak the word of God over the people of Crookhorn. It may seem like a dry and desolate valley when we see some of the things that go on out there. But God says, I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Many are walking in the valley of the shadow of death. But God says, I will put my breath in you and you will come to life. And I think we're beginning to see it already. God is working in the people out there. He is breathing his breath and he is drawing them closer. Jim's testimony this morning was, was a sign of that. This week, we've had two people from the community asked to volunteer in the cafe. Two people we didn't know before. And a couple of weeks ago, someone in the community gave me a vision they'd had. They saw cogs as a fortress with a bridge into it. But the bridge was broken and people weren't able to get in. I believe that the cafe is that bridge and that's why it's so important to mend it. And I'm not, but I'm, I'm not saying, please hear me, I'm not saying that all the other ministries are not just as important. They are. It's just I think it's something about having the doors open. I still believe that God wants the cafe to continue to serve breakfast. The original vision was so clearly from God. And I don't think it's changed. We've seen so much fruit. We've seen community building. We've made friends. We've got to know our community better. And our community have come to know us better and each other better. And through it, we've been able to offer support in debt management and in beating addiction. We've welcomed the police in. We've had interest from other groups wanting to partner with us. The council, council election candidates thought it was a great platform to come and meet the community a couple of weeks ago. I think uh, we've also learned more about what love is, that sometimes love gets thrown back in your face and it hurts. That love doesn't look like me or you. Sometimes it looks like a pile of bones which needs the breath of God. But our community has also realized that Christians are not scary Bible bashers. We are human and we can show real empathy. And what's more, we can be fun. And they want more. I was walking past um, a house in uh, Crookhorn just this week. Um, and there was a group of about eight people sitting in the front garden drinking coffee. 
They were all cafe customers. And they were discussing how the cafe can be brought back to life. How amazing is that? They want it. And they're willing to put into to it being here as well. Through the cafe, God has created a new community. These people didn't even know each other two years ago. Now they're in and out of each other's houses and wanting to share with us, share with us in what God is doing. God wants to breathe his life-giving breath into the dry and broken bones of this community and raise up another army, an army of new believers, one uh, who will become part of our body here in Cogs. Without them, we will die. With them, we will prosper and grow. So this year, I'm not asking you to volunteer more. I'm asking you to pray more. To pray the word of God and the name of Jesus over our community, over our church, over your own lives. God told Ezekiel to prophesy, and we're going to prophesy too. But we're also going to be more intentional in listening to God and being rather than doing. This year, we're going to have more of those listening to God together events. A few years ago, we uh, met on Zoom, and we used an app called Padlet to write what God was saying. It looked like this. I know you can't read that. <laughs> I've created um, a number of Padlet boards for the other 12 hours of prayer that we've had, so we can see what God has been saying to us over the last nearly five years. They are now all accessible on our website. You should be able to get to them from the front page of our website. They're no longer updatable, but you can read them there. But there is also a live page for you to enter what you feel God is saying to us now. So any pictures, words that you have, go onto our website and add it onto this page. Now, don't worry, it is going to be moderated. Um, so every entry will be vetted so that we don't get all sorts of weird things put up there. And, and you will be able to um, add to other people's entries, add comments, that which will also be vetted. So don't, don't worry. Um, so whatever gets put onto this page, will be used as a basis for the next Listening Together event. We don't have a date for that yet, but it should be soon. Eddie and David have also offered to host three sessions of Seeking God for Crookhorn and for Cogs. The first one is next Saturday at their house. I'm not going to tell you their address <laughs> because we're being streamed. But if you need their address, then go and ask, ask Eddie. But you need to come and, and um, see what God is doing and, and seek his will, to come into his presence, to seek his will for cogs and the community and to prophesy over these areas. You're welcome to go for uh, the whole 90 minutes or just some of it. I think it sounds great. Thank you for organizing that. And the reason that Eddie and David are doing this is because they felt that God told them to set aside three Saturdays to pray, specifically for cogs in the community. And they wanted to honor him. And that leads us to another new exciting venture, discipleship, or more accurately, discipline. Discipline is quite an ugly word these days, isn't it? <laughs> but it should be a core value of a person walking with God. In our busy lives, it's so easy to get caught up in the rush and demands of life. Unfortunately, the thing that gets squeezed out is quality time with God. Now, I, I know that I need help to be better disciplined. And I suspect that some of you do too. A deeper relationship with God comes from being disciplined. 
to make time to sit at Jesus' feet and to allow him space, to allow ourselves to be fed as we rest. God doesn't want us to be rushing around. He wants us to stop and to sit with him, to enjoy him for who he is. So to that end, we're going to be starting an evening service. Now, I know that sounds like we're, going to do, we're doing extra, but hopefully it will teach us to be more and to do less. So it's going to be called Practicing the Way. And it's all based oops, on this book, Practicing the Way by uh, John Mark Comer. Be with Jesus, become like him, and do as he did. So it is actually a course which we will use in the service, but it'll be a very relaxed atmosphere. Um, it will begin on su Sunday the 15th of September at 6.30, which is the, the fifth anniversary of me becoming the vicar here. <laughs> and there's a short video I've got to show you what we can expect. Who are you following? Everybody's following somebody or something. Put another way, everyone is a disciple. The question is not, are you a disciple? It's who or what are you a disciple of? 2,000 years ago, Jesus invited his first disciples to come and follow me. But what does it mean to follow Jesus today in our busy, digitally distracted, and increasingly secular cities? Over the last two millennia, millions of people have said yes to Jesus' invitation. It's changed not only their lives, but the course of human history. And it can do the same for you. So each session will include worship, reflections, videos, and group conversations and prayer. It's designed to help you get started on the journey of spiritual formation, or to help you get unstuck, or to guide you into taking your next step. It's about learning to be an apprentice to Jesus. So that's beginning in September. And then in January, we start taking a look at the actual disciplines themselves. We'll, take, we'll look at each one in quite a lot of detail. And I think as, if, as a church, if we, if we start practicing these disciplines, we will see massive amount of growth in ourselves, but also in the church. So that's the first um, four um, uh, spiritual disciplines, the Sabbath, prayer, fasting, and solitude. And then they will go on later on in the year to scripture, community, service, generosity, and witness. So I would really encourage you to come along if you're able to come on, on uh, Sunday evenings from 6.30. So this next year is going to be much more about being rather than doing. Becoming the people God wants us to be. But at the same time, being proactive in prayer and prophesying. And being expectant that God will bring new life. These bones will rise to form a mighty army. I woke up this morning uh, with a song in my head which says, don't tell me he can't do it. Don't tell me he can't do it. And it goes on to say, because I know he can. I know he can do this. Let's believe it. Amen.